Uh, our final speaker for this morning session is uh, Jeff Bradshaw. Uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Bradshaw has recently retired as a senior research scientist at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in Pensacola, uh, Florida. He has written extensively on uh, issues relating it to uh, his professional uh, interests. He has also published numerous books and articles on uh, issues relating to the temple, to Moses, Genesis 1 through 11, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> earlier, he was a missionary uh, in Belgium. Uh, more recently, he and his wife have completed uh, a mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kinshasa Mission, and uh, we will want to pass the time on to uh, Dr. Raja. Since uh, Matt Bowen started with aloha, I should say to each of you, mbote. Mbote, okay. <laughs> I've appreciated the chance we've had to um, hear the presentations this morning, and it actually made me think of the Kinshasa Temple, because um, every day when I'd pass the construction there, the temple was just right across the street where we were, we, from where we lived, I'd think about the name, the sign on the front that said, Holiness to the Lord. And it made me reflect that I wonder how many people who passed there realized that that was never something that in ancient times was placed on a building. The place where we see that referenced other than in Zechariah where it talks about being placed, everything being holy to the Lord, was the plate on the high priest's head. And so really it's not just a marker of sacredness of the building, it's uh, enjoining us to be holy as a people. So I've appreciated both what... Matt just presented to us from Ephesians and what Tom presented earlier and some of the other talks as well. So if we haven't got slides yet, I keep pressing HDMI um, and it doesn't seem to be doing the trick here. Let me, oh, I know what it was. I think that adapter wasn't in there. Let's see if that does the trick. Your magic. Thank you, Kerry. <coughs> came and it went here. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, it was maybe. Here's some you can stay and hold it. <laughs> okay. What would you do without our tech savvy sons? This is my son Samuel for which I'm very grateful for him to be here. And we go together sometimes to Kent Brown's class and institute, which we've really enjoyed. At any rate, today, my topic is beauty and truth in Moses 1. The presentation builds on a preliminary study that I undertook in 2010 with David Larson. That study compared the heavenly ascent of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price to a first century Jewish work called The Apocalypse of Abraham. Later, I shared the comparative study with a friend and scholar who is not a member of the church. As someone who has read and written about such accounts all his life, he found the, the comparative study intriguing. However, he went on to observe that in its narrow focus to describe some resemblances between the work of a modern scripture and an ancient document, we neglected some weightier matters. My friend kindly suggested that when I returned to my study of Moses 1, quote, it would be good to emphasize how edifying Joseph Smith's teaching is, how it benefits souls, and how it agrees with a long line of divine revelations. So I'm going to be a little bit more devotional, especially toward the end, than I would have otherwise been in, in uh, deference to that comment. In short, I was reminded that the divine message of Scripture is of greater importance than its human messenger. Applying this lesson, then, I'm going to say something about the wonder of the Scripture that was revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith, highlighting its beauty and truth. But before doing so, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the historical context in which Moses 1 was revealed and also say something about the genre and its setting. Historical context of Moses 1. The placement of the Book of Moses as part of the Pearl of Great Price obscures the fact that it was actually produced as part of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. This is the first page of the manuscript of Moses 1, dated June 1830. Like many of the prophet's revelations, the manuscript appears to have been flowingly dictated in a single setting. The account of Moses' vision was no doubt reassuring to Joseph Smith 
as he faced his own trials during the period this revelation was received. Richard L. Bushman observes that Moses' test, quote, echoed Joseph's struggle with darkness before his first vision. The book of Moses conveys the sense of prophethood as an ordeal. Visions of light and truth alternate with evil and darkness. After dictating the revelation, the prophet coolly summarized the challenges he had faced and described how the revelation of Moses I had provided needed encouragement. Quote, amid all the trials and tribulations we had to wade through, the Lord who will knew our infantile and delicate situation vouchsafed for us a supply of strength and granted us line upon line of knowledge, here a little and there a little, of which the vision of Moses was a precious morsel. The setting of Moses I. The events described in Moses 1 are described as having taken place sometime after Jehovah called Moses out of the burning bush, but before Moses had returned to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel. Two ancient Jewish manuscripts accord with Moses 1 in affirming that Moses received the stories of the creation and the fall in vision. As to the first, Douglas Clark has ab ab ably described the vision of creation received by Moses that is found in the book of Jubilees. Similarly, 4th Ezra preserves a tradition that the Lord led Moses, quote, up on Mount Sinai, where he kept him with me many days, and I told him wondrous things, and showed him the secrets of the times, and declared unto him the end of times. Then I commanded, saying, These words you shall publish openly, and these you shall keep secret. End of quote. The admonition to Moses in 4th Ezra to keep the most sacred parts of his revelation secret is a common trope in such visions. Moses 142 reads, Show not these words unto any except them that believe. Similarly, Ezra is reported to have been told that certain books were to be read by the, quote, worthy and unworthy, whereas others were to be given only to the wise. Likewise, the Mishnah contains a rule that certain texts could not be read in public or could be read but not explained. Ezekiel's vision of the throne was one such passage. It could not be discussed unless the other person already understood it of his own knowledge. Nor could the blessing of the priest, may the Lord make his face shine upon you, be explained. <laughs> Not coincidentally, the subject matter of all these restricted passages mentioned by the Mishnah had to do with the experience of what modern scholars have come to call heavenly ascent. Thus, the genre of Moses 1. The details of Moses' experience in chapter 1 place it squarely in the genre of the ancient heavenly ascent literature. Not surprisingly, the structure and symbols found in accounts of heavenly ascent are strongly related to those found in descriptions of the theology and rites of the temple. It is significant that Moses I was revealed to Joseph Smith more than a decade before he administered the full temple endowment to others in Nauvoo. One of the many witnesses that his extensive knowledge of temple matters was received in early revelations, not merely a result of late inventions. Although stories of heavenly ascent bear important similarities to temple practices, they make the claim of being something more. While temple rituals ritually depict stories of exceptional, I'm sorry, while temple rituals dramatically depict a figurative journey into the presence of God, the heavenly ascent literature tells stories of exceptional individuals who experienced actual encounters with deity within the heavenly temple. The completion or fulfillment of the types and images in earthly priesthood ordinances. In such encounters, the individual may experience a vision of eternity, participation in worship with the angels, and the conferral of certain blessings that are made sure by the voice of God himself. They may also, as Stephen Smoot has ably explained, acquire membership and admission as a member of the divine council. With specific reference to Moses, Louis Ginsburg, Ginsburg reports Jewish traditions that speak of several ascensions of Moses, a first at the beginning of his career, a second at the revelation of the Torah, and the third shortly before his death. Rabbi Nathan says that on Sinai, Moses was sanctified and became like the ministering angels. Going further, Philo is so carried away by the exalted Moses that he frequently speaks of him as having been deified or being God. In one instance, Philo wrote, quote, For when Moses had left all mortal categories behind, he was changed into the divine so that he might be made akin to God and truly divine. Now let's talk a little bit about a few of the literary features of Moses I. Vocabulary and phrasing. The most obvious thing one can say about the vocabulary of Moses I is that like the other translations and revelations of Joseph Smith, it is drawn almost exclusively from the Bible, which of course was the most influential book uh, uh, at the time Joseph Smith lived. In the first four verses of the chapter, Colby Townsend has found quotations, allusions, echoes, or parallels of words and phrases from eight different biblical books. 
Significantly, the more than 150 biblical references in Townsend's preliminary study, um, only a handful are long identical phrases of five words or more. The fact that resemblances are spread across so many biblical books and that these parallels tend to be brief and elusive supports the conclusion that Moses 1 was not simp li simply lifted wholesale from the Bible. Nicholas Frederick has performed a similar vocabulary analysis comparing the first chapter of John with the first chapter of Moses. He found ten resemblances, seven occurrences only begotten, two of full of grace and truth, and one of word. To this list, I would add an occurrence of wisdom because of its strong association with word in this context. We could dismiss these overlaps in vocabulary as being of little importance if we thought that they were simple, simply inconsequential instances of New Testament language about Jesus being lifted into Moses 1 and no more. However, as it turns out, the phrases only begotten, grace and truth, word and wisdom can find no better application than in a chapter about Moses in the Jewish tradition. Time precludes a full discussion of the sources, but in brief, Moses himself is identified in Jewish tradition as the only begotten and the firstborn. This is because he's seen as the preeminent living embodiment of the divine logos, the word of God's power, which is also strongly associated with Sophia, a personification of God's preexistent wisdom. Not only are the terms only begotten, word, and wisdom tightly bound to the roles and attributes of Moses, but in addition, when John referred to grace and truth in the first chapter of the gospel, he was specifically alluding to an experience of Moses recorded in Exodus. To appreciate John's allusion, it must be understood that the phrase, full of grace and truth, is the Greek equivalent of God's declaration to Moses in Exodus 34, 6, that he is, quote, abundant in steadfast love and faithfulness. Significantly, in both Exodus 34 and Moses 1, God makes this declaration immediately after appearing to Moses in glory. In John 1, the sequence of events is the same. We beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Thus, the ostensibly New Testament terms relating to Jesus that Frederick found in his analysis are completely at home in the story of Moses' heavenly ascent. Narrative structure. Now I'd like to say some things about the narrative structure of Moses 1. Though several of the individual episodes in this chapter are well known, Moses' confrontation with Satan, uh, his comprehensive vision of the earth and all its inhabitants, and God's declaration about his work and glory, how all these pieces join beautifully into a coherent whole has been generally underappreciated by scripture readers. My interest in the structure of Moses began when I noticed that in, the widely separate, in, that in widely separated parts of his vision, Moses seemed to be having the same experience twice. At the beginning of his vision, Moses saw the world and all the children of men. Then near the end of the vision, he seemed to have experienced the same thing again when he saw the earth and the inhabitants thereof. As I began to study Moses 1 in more earnest, I realized that Moses' experience was a complete tutorial on the plan of salvation from a personal perspective, including his departure from God's presence in the beginning and his glorious return to that presence in the end through his faithfulness. Now the seeming repetition of Moses' experience made perfect sense. In verse 8, early on in the vision, it seems that Moses saw the pre-mortal world and all the spirits that God had created, as is more clearly described in Abraham 3, 22 and 23. Later, in verses 27 through 29 at the end of his vision, Moses seems to have experienced a view from heaven of the mortal earth and all its inhabitants. I will now describe this narrative structure in more detail. Many stories are ritual or actual heavenly ascent are structured in two main parts. Uh, and uh, by the way, thank Michael P. Lyon and Don Perry for this uh, beautiful illustration. <clears throat> and my son Samuel, who modified a bit for me. Uh, there's a down road followed by an up road. This common two-part pattern can be found in scripture within descriptions of the fallen atonement, as well as in accounts of Israel's apostasy in return. More generally, accounts of heavenly ascent tell the story of the plan of salvation in miniature, as seen from a personal perspective. This pattern can be found in the masterful parable of the prodigal son. The life of Jesus Christ himself also followed this pattern, though unlike ordinary mortals, he was without sin. Quote, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. End of quote. With this background in mind, let's examine the narrative structure of Moses' vision in more detail. Consistent with the basic pattern of some of the other ancient stories of heavenly ascent, Moses' account tells of how he descended in vision from his first home in the spirit world and then undertook a step-by-step -step return to the Father. 
Unlike the figurative journeys that are represented in earthly temples, Moses' when ends with an actual encounter with God in the heavenly temple. From within the heavenly temple, he was then shown the story of the creation, the fall, and the atonement in detail, as was given to him in later chapters of the book of Moses. In the prologue, the opening verses provide what Bible scholar Lawrence Turner calls an announcement of plot, a brief summary of the most important events that will take place in the rest of the story. In this case, the prologue declares that Moses will be caught up to an exceedingly high mountain where he will receive the glory of God and after conversing with him face to face will enter into his presence. Moses in the spirit world. Following the prologue, Moses was given a description of God's attributes and a confirmation of his call to work which he had previously been foreordained as a son of God in the similitude of the only begotten. He was then shown the world upon which he was created, referring to this pre-existent spirit, spirit realm, and all the children of men which are and which were created, paralleling the view of organized intelligences given in chapter 3 of the book of Abraham. Moses falls to the earth. Having left the presence of God and no longer being clothed with his glory, Moses fell to the earth, meaning literally that he collapsed in weakness and figuratively that he descended again to the relative darkness of the telestial world. In this way, he repeated the journey of Adam and Eve as they left the Garden of Eden, landing on earth as a natural man, as Hugh Nibley puts it. Moses was then left to himself to be tested in a dramatic encounter with Satan. Satan tempted Moses, now in a physically weakened state, to worship him. A context of priesthood ordinances is implied. For example, having banished Satan through the power of the only begotten, a motif linked in ancient sources to baptism, Moses was afterward filled with the Holy Ghost. Moses called upon God and was answered from a voice behind the heavenly veil. Having continued to press forward, Moses calls upon the name of God in sacred prayer. Since the moment he fell to the earth, Moses could no longer speak face to face with the Lord, having been shut out from his presence. Following his prayer, however, Moses was answered by a voice from behind the heavenly veil, enumerating specific blessings. In a discussion of early Christian and Jewish temple rituals, our friend John Twetness noticed that prayer opens the veil to allow one to enjoy the presence of God. At the heavenly veil, Moses sees the earth and its inhabitants. While the voice is still speaking, the text tells us, Moses was permitted to look outward from the heavenly veil and there beheld every particle of the earth, all its inhabitants, and many lands, each called earth. Moses stands in the presence of the Lord. The culminating sequence of the vision begins in verse 31, when Moses, having continued to inquire of the Lord, came to stand in his presence. God spoke with Moses face to face, describing his purposes for this earth and its inhabitants. Moses was then shown the events of the creation, the fall, and how the plan of, re of redemption was given to Adam and Eve, as recorded in chapters 2 through 5 of the book of Moses. The most direct biblical parallel to Moses' encounter with Satan is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Just prior to the beginning of each of their formal ministries, the adversary found both Moses and Jesus in a solitary place and launched a personal attack intending to undermine their confidence in who they are and what they've been called to do. With astonishing presumption, the devil called for their allegiance and worship. In each account, Satan was defeated in his clever questioning by an unshakable adversary and was forced to depart. Because both Moses 1 and Matthew 4 describe verbal battles with Satan, it is useful to know how much overlap exists between the vocabulary of these accounts and between their overall storylines. In a preliminary study by Colby Townsend, he found 12 resemblances between them. In this diagram, I've classified these resemblances according to the section of Moses 1 in which they occur. There are two numbers displayed for each relevant section. The first number represents how many resemblances were found in that section. The second number gives a count of how many of these resemblances are unique rather than repeated. The assumption is that repeated occurrence of the same or similar terms or phrases is a weaker form of evidence for overlap than unique occurrences of different ones. The first resemblance, a near quote, occurs in the prologue and consists of a phrase, an exceedingly high mountain. Not surprisingly, the rest of the resemblances are found in the verses describing Moses' verbal battle with Satan. At first glance, the sheer number of resemblances looks impressive. However, closer examination reveals that all 11 resemblances come from only three verses in Matthew 4. And all 11 of them are based on the occurrences of only two key terms. Five of them have to do with the word worship, as applied to God or Satan, and six have to do with the occurrences of depart hence, or its equivalent. 
Moreover, every resemblance Townsend study identified between the two chapters except the first score on the weaker end of the spectrum of his classification scale, corresponding to a one or two out of a possible strength of five. In summary, Moses 1 and Matthew 4 share some general elements of a particular type seen in common. The specific uh, parallels, however, in the vocabulary are weak and limited to relatively small portions of the two accounts. As one reader commented, quote, this is not an example of Joseph Smith using the story of Jesus and Satan to tell the story of Moses and Satan. It is an example of Joseph Smith using a few elements of the language of Matthew to tell one part of the story of Moses 1 with a few similarities to the story of Jesus and Satan. Now let's look at a more promising comparison. At the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned a preliminary com com comparative study that I wrote with David Larson. Building on the earlier work of Jared Ludlow and Hugh Nibley, we looked at similarities between Moses 1 and the ancient story of heavenly ascent called the Apocalypse of Abraham. The Apocalypse of Abraham is thought to be Jewish in origin, though it has been preserved by Christian hands. It is noteworthy that the first publication of an English translation was in the church's Improvement Era magazine in 1898. Following an account of Abraham's tests and trials, fortunately we had some German immigrants uh, in the valley at the time, Following an account of Abraham's tests and trials, including a lengthy encounter with Satan who was twice commanded to depart before he complied, the Apocalypse of Abraham recounts the visionary journey of Abraham to the highest heavens, where, like Moses, he enters into the presence of God, learns the secrets of creation, and is given a grand vision that includes a history of the world and a view of the spirits that existed with God before the creation. In addition to the general similarities in structure, parallels and wording in conjunction with beautiful accompanying illustrations add much to our understanding of Moses 1. As would be expected in an account of heavenly ascent, the story includes depictions of ordinances such as sacrifice and various symbols associated with the temple. Looking at occurrences of language similarity in summary fashion paints an interesting picture. Every resemblance of Moses 1 to Matthew 4 finds its counterpart in the Apocalypse of Abraham but many more are found besides. These parallels are not confined to a limited fractions of Moses 1, but it rather is spread almost completely throughout. Moreover, whereas all but one, or one of the 12 resemblances of Matthew 4 are based on permutations of phrases involving two repeated terms, depart and worship, the resemblances between Moses 1 and the apocalypse of Abraham are highly varied and tend to be unique. One day I had a chance to sit down privately with a well-known Old Testament scholar, not a member of the church, to compare Moses 1 and the Apocalypse of Abraham. Only a few minutes into our conversation, the scholar, with a slow shake of the head, confided quietly, Joseph Smith can't have made all this up. It is significant that the strongest similarities between Moses 1 and the heavenly ascent literature are found in ancient manuscripts Joseph Smith could not have known. The Apocalypse of Abraham, as well as other relevant documents found outside the Bible, including, among others, the life of Adam and Eve, the Greek version known as the Apocalypse of Moses and 4th Ezra, were not published in English, or in most cases in any other language, until well after the death of Joseph Smith in 1844. The same is true for Moses 6 and 7, Joseph Smith's account of Enoch, which, like Moses 1, could not have been derived from a mere study of the Bible. While much has been made of the unlikely possibility that Joseph Smith had access to an English translation of First Enoch, or to relevant patristic citations as a source for his Enoch chapters, such arguments are off the mark. This is because, as with Moses 1, the most relevant sources were not discovered until long after the book of Moses was published. For example, the fragments shown here from the Aramaic Enoch collection uh, found at Qumran in the 1940s contains the name of the only named character in Joseph Smith's Enoch account besides Enoch himself. It is no wonder that the eminent Yale professor and Jewish literary scholar Harold Bloom has called the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham two of the more surprising and neglected work of scripture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He wrote that he was intrigued by the fact that many of its themes are, quote, strikingly, strikingly akin to ancient suggestions, while expressing, quote, no judgment one way or another but on the authenticity of this modern scripture, he said that he found enormous validity in the way these writings recapture crucial elements in the archaic Jewish religion that had ceased to be available either to normative Judaism or Christianity and that survived only in esoteric traditions unlikely to have touched Joseph Smith directly. Now quickly, a few words about parallelism and chiasmus. One of the strange things about the detailed structure of Moses 1 is the seemingly intrusive verse near the middle of the chapter that commands Moses not to share certain parts of his account with unbelievers. 
Once I saw this diagram of parallels from Mark Johnson, it all made perfect sense. The chapter as a whole divides into two parts composed of a series of parallelisms. And in addition to its narrative function, the seemingly intrusive verse is meant to signal the division between the two halves of the chapter to perceptive readers. Johnson also arranged the chapter as a chiasm. He wrote, the structure of the chapter dictates that the second half of the chapter is very closely related to the first half. The parallels are striking. The two divine encounters of Moses tightly frame his epic battle with Satan. With the center of the chiasm and the turning point of the story being Moses calling upon God and being strengthened. That's the bottom point of the narrative. One of Niels Lund's Law of Chiasmus demonstrates that the center of the chiasm often has a parallel theme in the outer portions of the arrangement as well. The center of the arrangement has Moses being strengthened. The theme of strength occurs in verse 10 and later in verse 25. Perhaps the most interesting parallel is the pairing with the oft-quoted Moses 139, where God's work and glory is explained with its counterpart in verse 5. Verse 39, when seen as an expansion of verse 5, gives God's work and glory a cosmic sweep that places humankind as a higher priority than all the rest of creation. Now briefly about its teachings. I know I'm running up to the edge here. Nature of God's work and glory, and I'll be a little bit devotional here, but rightfully so, I think. Of all the things that Moses 1 teaches us, nothing compares with the clear and direct message of Moses 139, reputed to be the most cited scripture in the church. For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. This verse reveals that the full power of God's unswerving will is bent to save and exalt mankind, not only as noble and great ones, but also the rest of us, the ignoble and small ones, helping prepare us to be fit someday to receive all that he has. It is a tremendous thing to know that we live in a universe that is specifically engineered for our welfare, to know that our Heavenly Father is engaged in doing His work 24 by 7 for all eternity with no time off for good behavior. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He is always there to answer our prayers and He never withdraws to the highest heaven because He has become weary of our weakness and wickedness. His perfection consists in His total consecration to every creature that inhabits His universe. I'm grateful that He allows us to express our love and gratitude to him through sharing in his work. Agency and probation. The cosmic battle depicted in Moses 1 is not a head-on clash between the titanic forces of opposing gods or demigods. Rather, it is the battle of a man, Moses, who stands between those forces and is both enabled and compelled to make his choice. Mark Filonenko's analysis of the apocalypse of Abraham applies equally well to the first chapter of the book of Moses. Quote, the interaction between the good and malevolent powers does not occur directly, but rather through a medium of a human being, Abraham. Abraham thus becomes the place of battle between two spiritual forces. In this struggle, the Prince of Lights and the Angel of Darkness are fighting in the heart of a man." End of quote. Happily, God limits the length and character of our probationary experiences to precisely what we need and to no more than what we can endure. The reality of Satan. I don't know why this particular point came out to speak about, but uh, it came to my mind some, for some reason, so I'm going to stick with it. In the Western world, where most people have already discarded any notion of a personal devil long ago, and where they're increasingly tentatively in their commitment to the idea of a personal God, the Book of Moses gives an unflinching witness to the reality and personality of both. God has a body. He is not an impersonal force, but rather a personage who can speak and be seen. I don't like to testify as Satan, but I will say that I know that he's equally real and personal and is operating day and night. Without God's power protecting each of us to the degree we allow him to, we would, like Moses in his weakness, quote, fear exceedingly and see the bitterness of hell as Satan perpetually cries and commands with his loud voice and rents upon our earth. In calling upon God, like Moses, we receive the strength to command Satan to depart when he troubles us. If we are steadfast in our determination to worship, the only, the one God, which is the God of glory. Finally, the significance. The most important thing to know about the stirring account in Moses 1 is that it really happened. Let me explain why I think this is so. Those outside our faith are often initially attracted to, or sometimes repelled from, the church because of the distinctive lifestyle of its active members. 
For many, the promise of health and happiness for individuals, families, and communities is a welcome antidote for the angst and alienation of our age. Yet, perhaps counterintuitively at first blush, these aspects of personal and social well-being do not constitute the central nor usually the first message of the missionaries. Instead, they typically begin their series of lessons by reciting the historical events of the Restoration. The case for obedience to the doctrines and practices of the church, explained in subsequent missionary lessons, is thus made not as an appeal to the common sense of the investigator or to some body of empirical evidence, but by primarily on the basis that these commandments were given by divine revelation. In other words, potential converts are not asked to consider whether their lives will be happier in the long term as a result of accepting the gospel, though of course this is implied, but rather to find out for themselves whether the historical events of the restoration and the teachings revealed by modern prophets are true. The importance of accepting the truth and reality of the sacred foundational events of the Restoration carries over into the realm of modern scripture. Kathleen Flake has argued convincingly that Joseph Smith understood his lengthy revelatory additions to the early chapters of Genesis as narratives based on historical figures and events, not merely as flights of religious fancy invented for pragmatic ends. She writes, Smith's use of translate for all its discursive weaknesses conveyed his experience of creative agency before a text, and simultaneously his sense of being bound by the text of, as an account of events or as history. Taking the most obvious example, it can be said that, notwithstanding its English source, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible asks to be understood as a translation because it does not arise out of infinite variations available to fiction, but rather within the limits of an existing narrative of past events." End of quote. Flake goes on to observe, that seeing experiences like Moses' heavenly ascent as historical events affects a change in believers' perception of the past and anticipations of the future so as to change the way they act in the present. By this means, divine revelation about the past and the future acquires the power to shape reality, not merely to describe it. For example, knowing as President Russell M. Nelson testified at the most recent general conference that, quote, temple rites are ancient is thrilling and another evidence of their authenticity. When we accept the witness of scripture that individuals have actually participated in this same, quote, sacred and ageless work from the beginning of time, it shapes the way we approach our participation in temple worship. On more than one occasion, knowing of the reality of, I'm sorry, knowing of the reality of the events reported in Moses 1 shaped Hugh Nibley's understanding of how earthly temple rites relate to the actual heavenly ascent. His witness of the authenticity of scriptural accounts as such as Moses 1 led him to conclude that the endowment we receive in modern temples, quote, does not attempt to be a picture of reality, but only a model or analog to show us how things work, quote, end of quote. Those these ordinances are absolutely essential in this life. They are only a dry run, as it were, for the ordinances that will be administered in a perfect and final form in the next life. On more than one occasion, Nibley told the story of a conversation between his grandfather, Charles W. Nibley, and Joseph S. Smith, president of the church, after they attended a temple session together. Speaking rather matter-of-factly about the ordinances, President Smith said, Charlie, all this work will have to be done again. Hugh Nibley commented on this statement as follows. Well, the earthly temple is not the final, real temple. Here we do not receive crowns of glory, but only the promise that if we are true and faithful, later we may be qualified, we may be eligible, but not here. This is a training center, a school for precepts and a showplace for examples." End of quote. Of course, Nibley quickly added, that does not keep me from going to the temple. May we continue to increase our appreciation for the beauties and truths of Moses 1, and may this appreciation help us to go to the temple is my prayer. Thank you. A couple of questions, I think. If I could see. Yes. Sir? Okay. Uh, you mentioned a, a book by Johnson. I, I just wondered if there's any place where we could find a chiastic breakdown of the book of Moses. Uh, nobody's done anything complete, or Read my that view. Question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was Has anybody done um, a complete chiastic you breakdown? Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a book that was proposed and later rejected that was all going to be about Moses 1, and Mark Johnson had a chapter in it, uh, and uh, that chapter uh, has not been published so far as I know, but he did some great work. 
Yeah, how do you respond when people ask you, is this Moses, uh, is Moses one his endowment? Well, I would respond that endowment is different than from heavenly ascent. So there he, he ascended to the actual presence of God. What we're doing, in a sense, is a dry run when we go through the temple. That's how I'd respond. Um, I think that's it. Thank you.